Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. I gotta start out by thanking everybody that showed up to last week's weird creator-focused whatnot stream. I honestly expected to be all alone sitting there wondering if anybody was ever going to show up. Like, Foltar's birthday parties. But anyway, we had a great time, and there's going to be another crazy one this week with some nutty stuff, so please stay tuned at the end for more of that info. But let's jump in and see what we got. First up, Sony just announced some pretty major changes to their PlayStation Plus service that affects both modern and retro gamers. So I'll run through the facts pretty quickly, and then there's some things to talk about as well. But first up, the standard PlayStation Plus isn't really changing. That's going to be $10 a month or $60 for a full year, and you get pretty much what you already get. Adding $5 more a month or totaling $100 a year, so 40 bucks more a year, gives you access to 400 PlayStation 4 and 5 games. And then $3 more than that, or $120 a year, gets you the ability to try games for a limited time before buying, and also gives you access to emulated cloud streaming versions of PS1, PS2, PS3, and PS Portable games. So... It, right off the bat, if you're somebody that likes to play a variety of games, this is probably going to be something you should at least think about. I know for me personally, I've bought a bunch of games on the Switch that I ended up not liking, and it's just subjective. One of them was a very broken game that kept crashing, but the rest of the ones I didn't like were mostly just things that are preference-based, and if I had the ability to try before buying, I wouldn't have bought it. And on top of that, I don't think, or I think I would have spent a lot more money on games overall if I had the ability to try them and say, mm, this isn't for me, I'll spend my money elsewhere. Whereas, you know, towards the end of the year saying, hey, I already bought four games that I couldn't stand and some of them I even tried to finish just out of principle, so I'm not spending any more money on this stuff. I feel like if I had just spent the money on this service, I would have spent less over the course of a year and been able to try a bunch of games and pick which ones were right for me. So in theory, it sounds really great. I'm not sure in practice how that would end up going, but it's definitely something that you should at least think about, because I think I personally would benefit if Nintendo did something like this. I don't own a PS5, but hey, maybe this might push me to get it if I could ever find time to, to jump deep into gaming again. However, uh, there are the emulation side of things are where it gets a little weird. And this is all 100% speculation, and I normally don't like to speculate on anything, but Modern Vintage Gamer posted a video, and it's my opinion that he nailed it. Um, his guess is that, and respectfully, it is a guess, but his guess is that Sony's basically going to take their existing emulation solutions and kind of tie them into this. So it's not going to be fixed or updated or at least at first, I would assume. So if I don't know if I would recommend doing this just for backward compatibility through these cloud streaming services. If you wanted to sign up for all the other reasons and consider this a bonus, cool, but I'm just not sure if the emulation is going to be there yet. Now, for details as to why, uh, as to a lot more you know, facts to back up the speculation, please check out MVG's video, you know, no spoilers, I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent it, and I certainly don't want to do nearly, or I wouldn't be able to do as good a job as he did, so if you're really interested in that, check out his video, but I do definitely want to say that while it is respectfully speculation, I think he nailed it, and I think it's something that isn't really going to be nearly as good as what Microsoft was able to accomplish, at least yet. Maybe it'll be something where it evolves over time, but I guess that remains to be seen. This week's podcast is once again brought to you by JLC PCB, and this week we're in kind of an interim. The past few weeks I had shown how to start creating your PCB assembly order. They are en route and should all arrive this week at some point. So while I'm waiting for the final assembly to show you how this all resulted, I figured this was a good time to show you what happened after the video. So let's pick up where we left off last week by going into my order history. And you'll see everything pop up. And the first thing I just want to mention really quickly is the shipping. You'll see the shipping charge of 20. And that's because I picked the fastest shipping possible, which meant it could get here in about a week. So if you're on a budget, you could easily pick cheaper shipping. But anyway, if you go into product details, you could see part placement where everything was already populated. But more importantly, you're going to want unselected parts. So if I had chosen to, I could have ordered all of these through their service. And to be honest, if you're going to be doing a large run of assembly, I would strongly recommend doing that so that you could have them 
pre-populate everything for you. But since this is only a run of five, I wanted to just take everything that was out of stock due to the part shortage and populate it myself. So now that you have the spreadsheet, you just need to go to whatever your store of choice is and start copying and pasting the part numbers to see if they're in stock. To speed this video up, I already populated a bunch of them for you, and I'm just gonna delete all the parts that I already populated to make it easier to know what's left. So let's use the final remaining part that I know DigiKey would have, which is the 100 ohm resistor. So this is a 0603 resistor that I already have the part number in the bill of materials. So we're just gonna search for here and see if it's in stock. If it wasn't, it'll still show up just with zero stock. So all you'd have to do is reference the product attributes to find something exactly like it. But since this is in stock, all you have to do is make sure that you could order the minimum quantity. And since we need four and I'm making five boards, that's 20. So I'm gonna throw a quantity of 30 in there just because they're easy to lose and drop. Um, and there is no minimum order quantity. This isn't one of those ones where you have to order a thousand. So that's pretty much it over on DigiKey. Now, because we're in a global part shortage, we're gonna have to go to multiple stores, but to be honest, for something like the SCART connector, you would have to go to a different store anyway. So we're gonna move over to console5.com where I know they're gonna have the plug style surface mount or through hole mount SCART adapters. Uh, and I'll just order them right from there. This will probably be something you'll have to run into for any weird specialty items made in small quantities, but if you're ever doing a large run, just contact JLC PCB. So that's it for this week. Check back next week where we're going to have final assembly and see how they look when they arrive. My Life and Gaming have just posted an absolutely amazing in-depth look at the Mr. FPGA project. This video, which is over two and a half hours long, answers pretty much every question you could have about the project. And even if you're already a Mr. user, you might want to check this out just to catch yourself up with everything else that's been going on, all of the different options that maybe you kind of skimmed over at first because when they were implemented, they were kind of developer focused at first, but now they're consumer focused. Uh, I don't know if those are the best words to choose but hopefully you all get what i mean but overall it's just if you really want to know what the mr project is all about this video encompasses all of that and it was fact checked by some mr developers and some other awesome people in the retro gaming community it's really it's the quintessential example of what my life in gaming does a whole bunch of really nerdy facts wrapped together with some absolutely beautiful shots and a really easy to understand, just deep dive into Mr. So I really can't say enough good things about this. And I will also say that the Mr. FPGA project is evolving, evolving so quickly, but most of the points that are said here absolutely will stand the test of time. And even if things change or are added, what's in this video still applies. So honestly, I can't say enough good things about it. Now, if you don't have 300 minutes to spend on a video, what about 10? All kidding aside, I also posted a getting started video for the Mr. Project, and I had been working on a Mr. video series for a long time, but I didn't know if I was going to make it one long video, if I was going to break it up. Um, some parts of the video were already done because those really aren't going to be changing anytime soon, yet there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's already in the midst of changing, and I didn't really know how to go about doing it. So when Mark and Corey said that they were releasing their video last week, I scrambled to finish mine as well. And I have to do uh, just a little aside for a moment. When I first started doing YouTube stuff, I thought that doing something like that would steal their views. And it took a few years, honestly, for me to realize that in a situation like this, all we just did was bump each other up in the algorithm by releasing at the same time. It would be different if we both did a video about the exact same thing that was the exact same length, like if we both interviewed the same dev about the same game at the same time. Like, yeah, that would be a negative influence. But, you know, to all the people that think this was like a shot at my life in gaming, uh, it's quite the opposite. I, I really kind of redesigned and reshot my video to complement theirs. You could look at this as a 10 minute advertisement <laughs> for theirs. So however you want to look at it, it's fine. I'll just know that I meant it with love. And I also decided that since they were going to go the deep dive and I should go the short version, this would be really great as a getting started. So I think this is really designed for people that may have watched the Emily video already and then went back and went, okay, I love it. I'm in, I'm convinced, but what do I do again? So rather than having to scroll back through theirs, now you could just reference this. And I also embedded it in the Mr. Page on the website because I really do think that this is the perfect 
Like, here's the bare bones of what you need to get started. I don't even explain what a core is in mine. So this is for people that are already on board with Mr. and just want to start getting rolling in the project. Um, so hopefully they, they ended up accomplishing my goal of, of complementing each other. I, I really do think that, um, that it worked well that we both released them at the same time. But hey, if I'm wrong, then I will apologize. But I actually think I got this one right this time shockingly. So uh, most importantly, though, any information that you need to reference about Mr. I'm going to be leaving embedded in the Mr. page, which isn't done. I still got to add a link to lose stuff in here and all this other, you know, all the other things you would expect. But I have direct references to where to get the bare bones hardware. And that's kind of another focus of this is doing this on a budget. You could really, if you already have a micro USB adapter, you could get started with just the DE10 and nothing else if you really wanted to. So, uh, you know, while I would recommend going the distance and getting all the accessories you want, if you're on a budget or if you're not even sure if you'd like something like this, you really could do it on the smallest budget possible, which is essentially just the DE10. So I'll have all that stuff linked here. Hopefully this will be even more updated by the time this podcast goes live. Uh, but yeah, I just, you know, in case you couldn't figure it out, I'm a massive fan of the Mr. Project. Um, and I, I really hope that this stuff boosted the awareness in the right kind of way at the right time. So uh, if you want any info, check out both our videos. And of course, the retro RGB forward slash Mr. HTML. The company Data Discs has just released digital-only versions of some of their soundtracks that were previously available on vinyl. Now, I'll admit, when I first saw Crystal's post, the first thing I thought was, holy crap, does that mean that they're also in stock on vinyl? And no, only Space Harrier is in stock. Uh, I kind of missed the mark last time. I bought this one just to see what it was like, but I, I think Outrun would be my go-to. I always loved that soundtrack. But at the moment, you could buy those digitally via their Bandcamp page. So if you're somebody that already has a really great music setup and maybe you don't care so much about vinyl, you just really love the soundtracks, now you have the ability to buy those. And of course, I'm sure there's a bunch of people listening right now thinking, well, I could just go to YouTube and search for, you know, Outrun OST. Why would I want to buy them? And that's a fair enough question. Data Discs does a very specific process of how they rip their soundtracks to try to get it to be the best representation as possible. So I guess respectfully, if you're not somebody that cares about audio quality, going to YouTube is perfectly fine. But I think that Data Discs knows this and they're really catering to the crowd who, who takes audio seriously and takes their music seriously. So each album is eight bucks on Bandcamp, so totally, you know, totally respectable price. And you could download them anywhere from MP3 to FLAC. So you really could get very good quality out of this. So props to them for offering these soundtracks in other ways. Um, you know, I'm obviously a fan of this kind of music, but I'll be crossing my fingers for when the Outrun soundtrack comes back up for sale. Last week, I did a live stream where I tested out in real time two new versions of Raspberry Pi operating systems that were focused on both retro gaming and original resolution outputting. So a very quick background on this. These are OSs that have been around forever that I've always praised, but they're newer versions, and the focus is support for Raspberry Pi 4, as well as a bunch of other very awesome things. And our Pi 4 support has been spotty since its release because of drivers and a whole bunch of other stuff which kind of put us as gamers in a weird position because Raspberry Pi gaming was so easy all the way through the Pi 3 era, but now the Pi 4 was released, which is far more powerful and could do this emulation way better, but there wasn't much compatibility, so do you stick with a slower platform? Do you kind of wait for things to get updated? And I chose more of the options of just waiting to see what would happen and now is definitely the time to jump back in. Of course, now is the time where there's a Raspberry Pi shortage. So I left links to everything you need here, including a link to the RPI locator site, which I talked about a few months ago. Um, it's up to you if you want to buy one scalped. I did buy a couple because I needed to for testing, but respectfully, I refuse to post affiliate links to, uh, to anything scalped like that just because I don't want to tell anybody to spend too much money on that. I'll shamelessly post affiliate links to absolutely everything else that I think is relevant, including a raspberry pie shaped toothbrush if they freaking had one of those, but I just couldn't bring myself to, to post a direct link. So search on your own or wait for the our pie locator site to have one local uh, local region to you come up for sale. But anyway, enough of the primer to this. The 
two things that I tested were both the RGB Pi software and the new recall box software. And I definitely do not recommend watching that live stream. I left it linked below in that post for anybody who's really curious, but this was a real time explanation and example of what I have to do for testing. It is mostly boring. The best part by far was hanging out with people in the chat. And there was even, because this is beta and alpha software, one of my complaints about the refresh rate on the recall box software has already been fixed. So I don't know if I would sit through that unless you're really bored and want to see what it's like to be me some days. <laughs> but overall, here's my thoughts on it, you know, in the short term, at least for, for what I tested. RGB Pi is still my favorite. I just need RGB SCART out of a out of a Raspberry Pi. Um, the hardware broke because I kind of beat up on it, but I ordered another one. It's always been great. I was really happy with it, and um, I like their OS as well. The OS preference is really going to be up to you, but I did like that hardware. The Recall Box hat did have one very big advantage: is that it has a SCART output and a HD15 D sub output, which means you could just, uh, you could only use one at a time. And if you plug both things in at a time, it defaults to D sub. So it is safe to leave them both plugged in, although there's no reason to. Um, but that obviously allows for VGA if you want to, but it also allows you to connect just a very cheap VGA to BNC adapter. So if you're going directly to an RGB monitor or to an Xtron crosspoint or something like that, that might be the advantage. Now, the other big difference between the two pieces of software is the RGB Pi software is focused directly for use in 240p output using their adapter. And you can use it with other adapters, you just have to change the config.txt file like I'd shown in the past. Um, whereas Recallbox is designed to be used with absolutely everything. And I got to pause for a minute and praise both of the software and hardware choices because you don't need to edit any files in either of these in most cases. So if you're using the RGB Pi and the RGB Pi OS, just flash it and you're done. If you're using Recall Box, you're probably gonna have to boot to HDMI, but then you go right in the nice GUI and select which RGB device you're using and it changes the config text file for you. So no more weird text editors if you're using these. You could just plug stuff in and uh, you know, plugging into HDMI first, in my opinion, is not a hassle. It only adds a few extra steps in something that I think most people would prefer over trying to fumble with a config text file. The other thing I got to say about Recall Box is it's not only just focused on Raspberry Pis, you could use it on everything. So the HDMI experience, experience you get is legit, um, and it's the same across multiple platforms. So if you had something like, you know, uh, one of those uh, GP Pi, the things that look like a Game Boy DMG but have a Raspberry Pi in them, you know, if you wanted to use one of those and you also wanted to use controllers on an RGB monitor, you could have a streamlined interface across all of them that was the same. Uh, now, my preference, I kind of always preferred the RGB Pi, but that's preference. That's like music or, you know, what kind of beer you want. There really is no right or wrong. I just want to always share my thoughts on it, but that doesn't mean Recall Box wasn't absolutely awesome. Uh, the only thing that I would strongly recommend is if you're going to use any solution that relies on any of the back ends that these do, I would just try to get a controller that supports what it is that you're trying to do. So if you're going to mostly play Super Nintendo and then some beat em up arcade games, you can get that Retro Flag SNES controller for like 17 bucks and you're good to go. But if you're playing anything that requires an analog control stick, or if you are using anything that requires weird button mappings, I would really try to find a controller that already has all of that. Because I think in the three hour and 40 minute live stream, 90 minutes was wasted on trying to figure out how some of these God awful button mapping solutions work. Uh, you know, in the that was one of the reasons in the Mr. Video at the end I showed button mapping on Street Fighter and how fast and simple and, and there is zero room for confusion. This is the opposite experience with a lot of these emulations uh, solutions, and that's not the fault 
of any of these OS makers. It's kind of just the underlying way it all works. And uh, it's really my biggest complaint of, of emulation is getting these little things smoothed out when it should be a lot easier. So definitely pick up a controller that matches what it is you're looking to do. But that's kind of my mini review of both of these. You can't go wrong with either. Honestly, uh, I just would pay attention to make sure to get the latest versions and I would be completely comfortable recommending the alpha of RGB Pi and the beta of recall box because they were really, they were solid. They performed well. Um, the recall box complaint that I had about the Mortal Kombat strolling are already fixed. So don't even worry about that. If you happen to be on the, the live stream, um, I just would really take a moment to look at both solutions and see what fits your total setup the best. Do you have an all SCART solution and you just want to have everything integrated right in? RGB Pi is probably the way to go. Uh, do you want to bounce between HDMI and a VGA monitor and an RGB monitor? Do you want, you know, a whole bunch of different options? Maybe look into recall box. And do you want S video or component video? Maybe look into getting a RetroTINK Ultimate. I don't, I'm not sure if Castlemania has them back in stock, but then you could use recall box with that. Uh, or I guess you could also use the RGB Pi OS, but then you're editing the config text file. So, so it's one of those rare cases where there's no raw way to go there just might be a better way for your setup uh, and you know careful with the controllers because holy crap what a pain that was Stika just posted an interview with the crew that made Demons of Astaborg, and while I have not had a chance to watch this yet, I'm a big fan of Stika's, and I always think he does a great job in his interviews, so I'm sure it's something that's worth listening to. Also, Demons of Astaborg looked like an amazing game, and the same team is now doing kind of a spin-off of that, um, which is an action roguelike game. So I guess it's the same characters and artwork, but a different style game. So the interview discusses that, uh, the Kickstarter campaign around it, it, uh, and also, I guess, what it means to be a Sega Genesis developer in 2022. So, um, you know, shout out to Stika for always putting out this great content. I'm sure I'm going to enjoy the developers. I always like to highlight the behind the scenes work that a lot of these teams put put a lot of time into these projects. And I just want everybody to, to share in that awesomeness. So um, hopefully the interview went well. And uh, who knows, maybe they know what a beveled edge is now. I just posted an interview with Joe, aka Scarlet Sprites, and had a great time. In fact, I had such a good time, I was really concerned and how other people would like it, but the feedback's been great, and I guess it's just one of those things where the conversation flowed so well, it felt like two friends talking at a bar or coffee or something, so I was kind of interested to see how other people interpreted it, but... People seem to like it, and I really hope you all do too. Um, I love doing these interviews. They're some of my favorite things to do, uh, and it's just really great to highlight some of the people that I've been following and uh, I think very highly of and want to share with all of you. So uh, as always, if you want to listen to any of these audio only, go to wherever you find audio only podcasts. Uh, in this case, just search for Retro RGB and Scarlet. And in fact, you know, it should be on all the video services too. I don't uh, pick sides. I just want to put my content everywhere and let you choose whatever's easiest for you. So uh, if you're into this stuff, just search for Retro RGB Scarlet and uh, hopefully you'll find the podcast as entertaining as we did because I certainly had a great time. Oh, and make sure to subscribe to his channel and follow him on social media and all that. Now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm just going to skim through these, and if you hear something that interests you, please check out Lou's post as well as his video, and of course, subscribe to his channel and all that. There is a new arcade core for Joust 2 Survival of the Fittest. This was originally developed by Dar FPGA on GitHub and posted to, uh, ported to Mr. by Birdie Bro and Jason A. Next, there is a new core for the Mystic Marathon arcade game. And this one was also originally developed by Dar FPGA and ported by Birdie Bro and Jason A as well. Hotego also released a new beta core for Patreon subscribers for the arcade game Konami's Ping Pong. And uh, I know I skip through those every week, but I just want to reiterate, if you're a Patreon subscriber of Hotego's, you get all of this in real time. And if not, everybody gets it for free when they go public. So everybody kind of wins. There has also been cheats added to the PlayStation Core, which I had a time I had time to check out that core for the first time in a, at least a month when I was doing the Mr. Video and Wow, it's impressive. All the stuff I've been talking about is just as good as it looked in Lou's video. So, whew, that one's going to be a killer. 
There is also someone named Mike Simone working on custom composite and S-Video core builds. And this is a very interesting update that I would like to take a look at when it comes out, because at the moment, all of those solutions require converting RGB signals to S-Video and composite. And while you could get a pretty darn good signal from the S-Video conversion, it's most likely that you're gonna have issues with composite because of the way that conversion is done. I don't wanna go off on a tangent here, but while it's a pretty neat thing to do, and if your your focus is S-Video, but oh, by the way, I want composite, I think it's worth a gamble. I don't know if I would buy any of those adapters just for composite, because you might have mixed results depending on the, each core, your display, uh, lots of different factors. However, what Mike Simone's trying to do is write the core itself to output those signals. And in which case, all you would need are just basic pinout adapters with some minimal circuitry in it, which Mike's also working on. So these have the potential to be just like, I guess just like Mr. Outputs, theoretically the best possible RGB signal that any of these original consoles could output, because it's all done digitally in the core, you could technically have the best possible composite video output from these cores using this method. Which means if you're like a Sega Genesis fan and you wanna play it in composite, you don't have all of those crazy jail bars that you get out of most Genesis consoles, because especially the Genesis ones are just known for noisy composite. So it would actually be a step up, which I think is great because there's so many awesome CRTs out there that are only composite video. Or I guess even only RF, but you could just run that through a VCR. So that's um that's definitely something that I'm gonna be keeping my eye on, and hopefully I could do a video on that or work with Lou on a video or something. There's also a work in progress Spark Station core. And Spark Station were a series of workstations developed by Sun Microsystems that had its own hardware architecture that ran on their custom Spark CPUs. Gonna admit, I don't think I've ever heard of those before reading this post, so uh, that's gonna be interesting. And I do truly think that preserving the weird is just as important as preserving all of the mainstream stuff. So while of course the PlayStation Core is gonna get a lot more eyes on it, um, props to the people working on the Spark Station Core and all of the ones like it. Uh, there's also a Google Slide PDF project being created to provide tips and helpful commands for cores, which I think is a great idea. Um, so for example, the Commodore 64 document has a diagram that shows you which Commodore 64 key maps to the key on your keyboard. I love that. I love uh, even just a basic cheat sheet with what the F, you know, the function keys do. If you have a keyboard plugged in, I think that's a really great idea. Um, also, uh, Lou highlighted the saved file converter I talked about last week, and it looks like I, I made an improper comment too. I think I said something like, I hope the full Genesis conversion would be rolled in. It already was. So not really too big a mistake because if you were going to go to that website and use it, you could see it right there anyway, but I definitely wanted to shout out the creator and, you know, apologize for that. Um, of course, I already talked about the, uh, the My Life in Gaming and My Videos. And there is also another core for the Entex Adventure Vision, developed by Kitrinx. So that's a cartridge-based based video game console housed in a portable arcade-like cabinet. So I guess something that's kind of like a Vectrix, but without a vector monitor. I've, I vaguely feel like I've seen one of these before, but I'm drawing a blank at the moment. Um, and lastly, one other core for the original, or one core has been released for an original game called Slug Cross. So that's something that I'm going to try to make this quick because I would want to talk for hours about, but I've always been so curious of now that we have this FPGA architecture here, can people just make essentially like their own game from scratch using the tools that they have available? So maybe something's written like an arcade style game, but they pull the 486 chip or, you know, they pull the audio chip from something else and basically have one core that's an amalgamation of a bunch of others that allows you to have a essentially a totally new platform. I'm kind of curious to see how much work that would be, if you could mix programming for that. I'm not really smart enough to answer that myself, so maybe one of the devs would be able to have a chat with me about that sometime, but looks like at the very least, somebody started the basics of that for the game Slug Cross. So as always, thanks very much to Lou for taking care of all of this stuff and keeping us in the loop. And uh, you know, thanks to everybody involved in the Mr. Project, because like I said, holy crap, what a cool project. 
Greg from Laser Bear has just released protective flip cover shells for the Memcard Pro. And if you're one of the many listening audio only, this is not a replacement for the already beautiful shells that the Memcard Pros are encased in. This kind of looks like a flip phone that you put your Memcard Pro into that you could then flip closed and that way you could take it with you and don't have to worry about scratching up the really nice case. So I am a huge fan of stuff like this. Uh, I don't always need all of them, but when I do, I'm just very very happy they're there. So um, I guess this could be like the Dos Equis of of flip cases for the Memcard Pro. You might not always need it, but when you do, Greg's got you covered. Um, price is $15, and if you have a 3D printer of your own, you could be able to print your own. Um, Greg also released the, the 3D design file of it. So if you have a 3D printer and you want to mess around with it, then, you know, try it yourself. And if you want to support the creator and buy one pre-made, you can get it right from Laser Bear. The Sega Saturn Shiro crew have just posted what they're calling a completely spoiler-free review of Sonic 2. They don't talk about or show any pictures of anything that wasn't in the trailers already. So if you've seen the trailers and you'd like to know their thoughts about the movie, definitely check this out. This is from the perspective of Dave and Pat, as well as, I believe, Dave's son. So you get, you know, the old man who grew up with Sonic, as well as a kid's view of it, which I think is great. For me personally, with respect and love, I haven't read it. I haven't even looked at the post because I am one of those very weird people that doesn't even want to watch a trailer for a movie anymore. I think it was like, I mean, it was back when I was a kid, probably a late teenager, trailers for movies started to add some of the best parts in the movies to rope people in. And I really think it took away from it. So not in all movies, but in some. So I kind of just didn't, I kind of stopped watching trailers. And I will say this. I went into the first Sonic movie completely skeptical. I didn't watch any of the trailers. I had just seen all of the posters people were talking about where they had to digitally change what Sonic looked like, but that was really it. I didn't even watch any of the trailers. I expected it to thoroughly suck, and it didn't. I I really enjoyed it. I thought it did a good job just kind of being a fun movie, but also having some fun Sonic references. And I expect the second one to be the same because I think, you know, Jim Carrey always goes the distance and uh, I I hope, I hope it's as good as everybody says. So the only thing I guess I will uh, say is that I heard that they liked it. So if you want to know more info on it, please read that post. Uh, Or if you're a weird, grumpy old man like me, close your eyes and walk away and don't look at anything Sonic related until you see the movie yourself. If you're a Sega fan, I have a very exciting WhatNot stream coming up this Friday. Tito from Macho Nacho Productions is going to join me while we hang out. Uh, I think there's going to be at least one giveaway. Tito's going to be listing some stuff, some handheld related stuff as well. And I'm also going to be selling off some of the stuff I bought for triple bypass development because no one needs 10 of these things anymore. We actually did when we were doing the development, but uh, I have a mega SD and the MSD EXP, which I'm legitimately just selling because I haven't used it since I did that live stream with beast. Uh, I also have a triple bypassed nomad with the RGB driver in it. And it also comes with a laser bear rechargeable battery pack. That one's a pretty big deal if you're a fan of the nomads. And while it's not in this picture yet, I also have a triple bypassed Genesis three with a 32 X, both of which have been recapped and it's got the laser bear 3d printed adapter and it, uh, two official Sega power supplies. And I'll talk more about it in the whatnot stream, but something that I was reminded of this morning when I listed it was that if you have a triple bypassed Genesis console, most likely composite video would have had to have been disabled to get the best RGB quality, which if you're going through the trouble of triple bypassing, you probably don't care about that. But there are a bunch of people that want composite video. And I totally forgot that when you use a 32X with a triple bypassed console, you can get composite video out of the 32X because, and I think I talked about this in the past, but the Genesis console outputs RGBS to the 32X. And from there, the 32X uses its newer 1645 chip. I think that's the CXA number to convert RGB to composite video, which is a newer chip than what was in the original Genesis ones and a bunch of the Genesis twos. So there was a myth going around for a long time that 32X made your Genesis look better. It actually was kind of true because even without all these mods, if you're able to output RGB through your Genesis and then composite from the 32X, you're getting the better chip. So I wanted to share that with my fellow nerds here because I had 
totally forgotten. Uh, I'll kind of do a demo of that on the stream, but that essentially means whoever gets this Genesis 3 gets Genesis 32X. If you end up getting the Mega SD, you get Sega CD as well, all through the best possible stereo audio, RGB video, and I guess composite video too, if you want. So uh, this one's going to be a, this one's going to be a doozy. They're, um, you know, they're not going to go for a dollar, but hopefully they won't go for, for too crazy of a price. But I think if you're a Sega fan, you should definitely check this one out. And of course, there's going to be the usual kind of cheapies to, to get people rolling. I think I have a, um, you know, light gun or something as well. Tito's got some cool stuff. So if you're not on the platform, as always, please join with the link I have posted. So you get $10 off your first purchase uh you know following me is nice as well but you don't need to to get your 10 bucks all you have to do is use the link that's right in the page and as always for more info on all these streams retrorgb.link forward slash whatnot before i go i have some absolutely nutty news to share with all of you i am so excited to say that i will be presenting at the retro games festival in sao paulo brazil May 27th and 28th of this year, so just late next month. Um, there is a trailer that is coming up on their YouTube channel today at 7 p.m., so when this airs at 7 p.m., and uh, I, I just, I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to get down there and to meet all of my friends, uh, to be able to present. I'll, I think I'll be doing a panel both days, and I'll also be hanging out every moment that I'm there. I want to meet as many of you as possible. I am so excited to finally get down there and hang out and spread some retro gaming love with all my Brazilian friends. So uh, if you live in the area, please come by. I would love to meet you. If you live kind of far, maybe this is the time to go to a trip to Sao Paulo. I don't know. But I'm just thrilled to get out there. Hopefully we can try some very awesome food as well, because uh, everybody that talks about Sao Paulo talks about the food uh, and, and the different cultures of food that you could find there as well. C clearly, I'm a fatty. That's, I got to mention food in this, too. So uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of this. I'm so looking forward to absolutely everything except the 10 hour flight. <laughs> but don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll have a cup of coffee. I'll perk up and I will be happy to hang out the couple days that I'm there because this is just super exciting for me. So can't wait to see all of you there. And uh, of course, we'll have more news on this and update everybody as the time goes by. But basically, at the end of next month, I will be hanging out for the weekend in Brazil with all of my friends out there. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thanks so much to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to everybody who supports, because it is you who is keeping all of this going. So if you want to support in any way, or if you know any friend that might want to, please go to retrorgb.com forward slash support.html, and there are links to every service in there, including ways that you could support at zero cost to you. You can go to Amazon or eBay and buy the same thing you were already going to buy at the exact same price, but I'll get half a Depending on the sale and all that stuff adds up. So thank you very much. And I will see you all next week. <laughs>